so I will press on. So we're going to talk about digital participatory budgeting with young Scott today. Um, uh, and we've been doing this for about 12 years, supporting local authorities and other partners to deliver uh, participatory budgeting across Scotland. And that's what I'm going to uh, talk to you about today. But my first question, let's just have a quick vote. What is the best chocolate bar out of these four? Is it Mars, Twix, Dairy Milk or Galaxy? So just have a vote now. Uh, and what we've got, 14 folk voted, 15 folk voted, 17 folk voted. It's getting there. It's getting there. Uh, 18 folk or some people taking time, really thinking about their choice, making sure that they make the right choice. And someone obviously maybe seeing Mars didn't have any, any votes and has gone for Mars at the end there. The only point to that, because obviously other chocolate bars are available, is to demonstrate how quickly a digital vote can take place. We have a winner. Galaxy is a clear winner there. Everyone who's in this meeting can see. Um, hopefully we trust the process. We trust that everyone in this meeting was um, valid to vote, was eligible to be part of this process, and we have a clear winner, and it's taken seconds. That vote took me probably 30 seconds to set up, and it took you 30 seconds to vote. We have done it. We've achieved um, a quick vote, and a decision has been made about which is the, the, the most important thing. So I really want to underline that, that digital should be seen as a tool that can really help save time, energy, and money in the right situation okay because obviously we're in the room today or in the digital room today there are lots of people who couldn't make it they didn't get to vote there are maybe some people who don't have the technology to join today they didn't get to vote okay so there are barriers and there are issues but but a vote can take place really quickly really easily really cheaply and you can get a result of that type so here one a little bit more complicated with this uh slide can you just give me some indication of how confident you feel in running a PB in all terms? That's like a a face to face PB. Maybe how confident you feel in digital community engagement in the widest possible thing of, dig, uh, of digital engagement and then how you feel about digital participatory budgeting. So you're know, rating each of those between one to five. Uh, and once you've uh, done your little scales, don't for, uh, forget to click submit on the bottom of your uh, uh, bottom of your, your screen on your phone. We'll have the submit button. So we've got 10 folk voted now. We can see things are lo looking pretty average, actually. Uh, most of you kind of in the middle, um, middle there. Uh, and that's OK. So I really like Menti for this. It's just, just to point out this feature of Menti in the background, rather than just the average vote, we also get the spread of the votes because obviously uh, with an average, it could mean that everyone was either a one or a five, or it might mean that there was a spread all along the way. And this gives a really nuanced result really, really fast, which again, would not really be possible with a face-to-face -face sort of sticky dot type tool. So it's adding value, potentially adding value to decision-making processes that you do by having that quick, easy but nuanced depth to uh, the discussion and and you know if you've never used Menti before feel free to drop me an email and I can talk you through it but it is not difficult to do uh, we've got a young Scott's got a pro account on Menti which does cost us about 250 pounds a year I think but you can use a lot of these tools particularly if you're only doing a few slides uh, can be used completely free of charge so um, uh, and there are other other tools like Menti available as well so we can see that our confidence there is um, higher at running a PB than it is about running a digital PB. OK, and that's maybe as I expected and absolutely fine. But hopefully uh, by the end of the day, you'll be thinking that maybe you should add digital to your PBs. So here and this, uh, I have robbed this, I have to say this. I first came across this this thing where, with bikes, with cycling, where um, if you want a bike, you can have two out of um, strong, light and cheap, right? So you can have a strong and light bike, but it's going to be really expensive. You can have a strong and, expen uh, and cheap bike, but it's going to be really, um, uh, um, really heavy. Uh, so um, I think there is an analogy with PB. You could have low cost, you can have robust and you can have high turnout, but you can probably have only two of those at any one time. OK, um, so. 
with low cost, I'm talking here not just about actual financial costs, but in terms of staff time, volunteer time, uh, there are actual costs, printing if you're doing it face to face, all that kind of stuff, renting a space if you're doing it face to face. You can have a robust system to vote, but the the, the more robust you want your voting system, the, the the harder it's going to be. Like the like obviously you've got the electoral roll at one end, and then you've got like well we'll just let people tell us that they want to vote. Uh, arrive in the if anyone comes in the room they can vote. Is that robust enough for you? And I'm not saying you need to be more robust. I'm saying picking the right level of robustness is really important when it comes to a, a PB. And then high turnout. Well, you know, how many people is enough uh, for a participatory budgeting activity? How many people on the shortlisting panel or the or the steering group? How many people voting is enough for you? Because again, it's going to cost probably time and energy uh, and cost you in terms of robustness if you want to broaden that out and get more people voting. So quite difficult. So in this next slide, maybe you could tell me what's your most important. And this one, you just have to put a pin on the image in either uh, in somewhere in robust, low cost or high turnout or in one of the wee bits in between. Now, please don't put your pin in the middle because I'm kind of saying that you can't have that. You can't have low cost, high turnout and robust, uh, I don't think. So um, what is your most important bit there, do you think? So there we go. We've got a um, couple of things in robust and high turnout. We've got a couple in low cost and high turnout. We don't really have much in the, oh, there we go. As soon as I start to say it, we've got a little, a little bit in robust uh, and low cost and robustness coming out. The key here, I think, is that there's disagreement. What's most important in your PB? And this will be different for each PB activity. And I think part of that is how much money you're talking about. If you're talking about giving £500 out to community groups, you're going to have a different approach to if you're spending £5 million on a, on a capital project. You are going to have a different approach. And thinking about it in those terms, I think, is really important. Um, so I've put here, if we want the robust or the low cost option, we end up with something like, and a, this is just an example of a committee vote where we, we, we know that those people are definitely eligible to vote. And if we want it low cost, then, well, it's probably not going to be very big. So maybe that's just like, well, we'll have the um, community council vote on this topic. That's that's what that kind of looks like there. Over here, robust with a high turnout. Really, the most we're looking things like a referendum or a general election at robust and high turnout. You know, you're, you're looking there and, so, and we can we can see we know the cost of things like a referendum or we know the cost of a general election and they are in eye watering millions of pounds level quite difficult and then in the low cost and high turnout i think this is where most pb actually sits uh, and that's okay but like giving up some of the robustness for a low cost and a high turnout otherwise we'd be spending all the money that we have for pb on uh, on delivering it rather than giving that money out to communities but thanks for that. But I think the key thing here, here is there is disagreement on, on the page. We're not all uh, necessarily thinking the same things are important. OK, so here's some examples of voting in a face to face way. Up here, we've got the kind of Tesco. I, can't, I, I couldn't find an image where you could see the results of the Tesco thing. But this is that thing where, you know, you get a little coin when you buy some um, stuff at Tesco and then you drop it in one of three slots for three community groups. Uh, I'm on the board of community groups that have had money from this. Long may that continue. It's great to get that that few hundred pounds or few thousand pounds. But the process is clearly flawed. Like you, first of all, you have to buy something in order to vote. Secondly, you can see which which project is winning the whole way through. I'm not sure that's uh, very fair. Uh, and thirdly, you know, quite often a parent such as me will just give that coin to their wee uh, child who just puts it in the slot that they think looks the best rather than reading through the. Um, uh, what the projects are about. So there are challenges with that. Over here, maybe this is one that we recognize from PB, sticky dot type exercise, um, where everyone's been putting their blue dots on, on the page. This is great. I love this. I love doing that. So please don't get me wrong thinking this is a criticism, but this is not necessarily a robust process. So if I've said, oh, you've got three dots and you need to put each dot on a different sheet. Is anyone checking that I didn't just put my three dots on the same sheet? 
Is anyone checking that I didn't give again those three dots to my three-year-old child who can't read and has just um, put the dots on wherever they want to? Has anyone checked that everyone in the room can reach the top um, top sheets? Uh, so maybe they're too high, they can't reach them. Has anyone checked that, oh, well, this one was doing really well at the start of the day, so everyone knew that was already going to win, so they voted for other ones even though that was their favourite? Has anyone checked that? These things are quite challenging. Show of hands down here. Brilliant. In the right sense, right setting, a show of hands is maybe the best way to make a decision. And at the bottom, a ballot box, okay, it's maybe secret, um, it's uh, um, maybe um, uh, more secure, but someone's got to deliver those ballot box out to all the community centres, someone's got to count all the votes, and someone has to make decisions about, oh, did that X cross the line, is it not in the line, is it, in, is it a... Is it a hanging chad? I remember hanging chads from a wee while ago uh, with voting and things like that. So there are challenges. All of these can be replicated online in some form or another. So you can use a menti like we just did. We'll give you that sort of fairly nuanced uh, setting. You could use SurveyMonkey or a similar tool uh, if you want uh, a vote that you don't really care who votes for that thing. You just want to show a hands and, and, and a kind of or, or a, a quick quick decision making but survey monkey won't be robust and you won't be able to collect personal data with the survey monkey here's a team's call we could just do a do a show of hands in our team's call if we wanted to we could do, we could just do a quick vote like that and this one at the bottom well kind of this is the one i'm selling for want of a better expression today this is the young scott voting platform which uses the young scott national entitlement card number which is a unique number uh, attached to uh, each card they're non-sequential uh, numbers and they are linked to the local authority where that card was issued. So a young person in Edinburgh has a different uh, code at the start of their number than a young person from Glasgow and Shetland and Orkney and all the rest of it. And we set up votes where we're looking for people from um, South Lanarkshire to vote. If your card was issued in South Lanarkshire, it does a quick test of the number on that card. If that number was issued in South Lanarkshire and it fits the algorithm for how the card numbers are generated, you will get to vote. And if it doesn't fit the test of uh, being from South Lanarkshire and fitting or fitting the algorithm, you won't be able to get to vote. So that means if you like your mate votes and they say, oh, why don't you just add one to this number and then you'll get to vote or something like that. That doesn't work. You can't do it like that. You have to you have to fulfill the uh, algorithm criteria. But what it doesn't do, and this is really important, is actually look up the data for young Scott card numbers, because that would be a real challenge in terms of data protection and information sharing so what it's doing is checking if the number could be real not whether it actually belongs to jimmy or jane or or whoever it is uh, it's just checking should this card number does it belong to south lanarkshire and therefore should they get a vote and then if that card number tries to be used again they won't get to vote in the same poll they only get to vote once so we've been doing this for a number of years uh, and these are the things that we uh, have have discovered, I suppose. Young people are generally missing, and by young people here, I'm talking to about 11 to 26 year olds, that's our age range. They're generally missing from all ages uh, PB. What I found as a, as, a, as a community member, I live in Midlothian, uh, and we've done some PBs here in uh, Newton Grange, which have been really great. Uh, and I love going to the community centre and, and, and making my vote. But what I find is it's folk of my age and similar. Um, actually, I'm a bit old now, but maybe maybe 10 years ago, my age and similar. And they're taking along their younger children. So younger children might get to vote. Uh, but the 11, the teenage years and the young adult years are missing from those processes in general. So there is a need for those young people to be uh, included. And I would suspect heavily suspect that that is the same for other equalities groups you know we we we, we know that 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 we you all know that that people are hard some people some groups are harder to reach than others and so we're talking about um you know um people of color we're talking about people with disabilities care experience people all sorts of groups that might be missing from a general pb digital can really help with that even when they are included, young people's PB tends to be a specific strand. So uh, there might be a wide budget for all people in the community, but uh, only um, uh, uh, a, a smaller budget dedicated to youthy things for young people. That's challenging. And I want both. I want my cake and eat it here because I think young people do benefit from having a dedicated strand. 
But actually what that tends to suggest to me is that we need to make the uh, all ages PB more engaging and more accessible. And if you make it more accessible to young people, the chances are you're making it more accessible for these other groups of people who might be missing as well. And here I'm talking about the language that's used and, and so on and so forth in the PB uh, and the tools that are used. There's a relatively low financial investment in youth PB. And we also know that participative democracy is not part of most young people's education. However, they're experiencing it in school projects. They're quite likely voting on topics at school and primary school. They're quite likely to be voting for who should be class rep and things of that nature at the school. But it's not linked explicitly to the democratic process. Uh, and this is my opinion rather than young Scott's opinion, but I think there is a, a bit of a deficit, if you like, in uh, the education of young people getting ready to be uh, full participants in Scotland's democratic process. Just one thing I forgot to say at the start, if you want to ask a question, you can either just shout out, but there is the Q&A function within Menti, so you can put your question into Menti, and if you do it that way, it'll be anonymous if you want to ask an anonymous question as well. So on each of the slides, there should be open Q&A. Uh, if you want to ask a question. So we've been using this for about 12 years, uh, working with local authority partners across the country, support PB and youth elections. The biggest use actually is the Scottish Youth Parliament elections where we're having 30,000 young people voting uh, at time. And this year in November, we would hope, I'm hoping for uh, uh, more than that. I think more than about 22 Scottish local authorities have signed up to use the platform in November. Uh, and so we would hope for 40,000 or so uh, votes. There is no electoral role for young people. They're missing. It's it's impossible. There are school roles, but they're actually quite hard to access for uh, other people within the even within the local authority um, uh, to access school roles and things like that. There's no real way of communicating with all young people, even in a school. So even if you use glue uh, or, or something like that, you're unlikely to be able to get to all young people. Uh, we also offer a temporary login for anyone without a Young Scott National Entitlement card. So we have we can generate thousands and thousands of temporary numbers for you if you would like to use that system. And the big advantage of that, and this is an offer uh, for those on the call, is that they're not linked to age. So if you wanted to run a PB, and several partners have done this, where you particularly you extend the age range of the voting lower than 11, perhaps to P6 or P5 age young people, we can give you temporary numbers for those people to vote. But actually, it's also possible for older people uh, to be offered a temporary number as well. And one of the examples that I'm going to talk about uh, did that. So we've had around 200,000 votes in the last uh, six years on that platform. And at the end of the last year, we've upgraded the, the platform. It's had a few teeth and troubles this year, which have been quite frustrating, but uh, it's now up and running and doing a really good job. So um, we've worked with um, Edinburgh and Renfrewshire as well, but they're here uh, themselves to talk about it. So I'm going to talk about some other examples. So North Ayrshire, many of you will have heard uh, North Ayrshire talk about their PB, uh, a really strong um, suite of PB activities that happen across North Ayrshire. Fabulous. But there are, for, for us, I think the key strengths of that, what made that work is having dedicated workers and building that experience of delivering PB over time so that it became a familiar proce process for the workers but also for the young people who are trying to vote. They've got, they've over time, they've gained widespread support of that process within the school estate and within youth clubs. And that's, uh, that means that when they have a vote in North Ayrshire, they're sometimes getting 10 times more votes than a similar size local authority area. And that's only been built up with um, uh, experience, I think. Moray was a good example. This is actually a few years ago, they were doing a new uh, PB with Moray right now. Um, but, uh, they acknowledge the challenges that young people face traveling around Moray and so put in place um, an online process with a face-to-face -face event at the end of the online process. What that meant was that um, using our temporary number system, young people who had to get to that event on the Friday night, chances are they were getting taken there by a parent or a grandparent and we just to encourage people to go we said well anyone who comes to that event whether a young person who's voted before in the election already or their parent or grandparent who brings them along, they'll all get an additional vote, no questions asked, if they come to that face-to-face -face event. And that really encouraged people to come along, celebrate the winners at the end. So what would happen is the vote was due to close at seven, 
The event ran from six to eight. I was able to be on the phone at 10 past seven saying this is who won. Uh, and they could celebrate that in the room together uh, and had loads of people voting. But it worked really well. And also, you know, capacity in an area like Mori that like diversely, geographically, diversely spread is quite thin. So they, they did that in local area communities, one after the other, rather than trying to do them all at the same time. And it was a really good decision, uh, did them one after each other. So they had capacity to send staff to each of the different localities. Aberdeenshire have run one uh, uh, in the last uh, few months, uh, a couple of times on school cluster areas. So um, uh, schools are engaged from the start. Uh, uh, doing it by school cluster meant that money is definitely going to go to all of the areas of Aberdeenshire rather than, rather than maybe being focused in some of the uh, more populous uh, areas. And they had remote support through uh, community limb development and young Scott staff uh, ourselves to help with that. Again, a really good way of doing it so that young people are voting for their community and their community only uh, rather than the whole of Aberdeenshire. And I'll come on again to why that might be a problem. I'm conscious I'm running out of time, so I will accelerate a little. So some key advantages of using digital process. Um, firstly, time is saved on counting, instant results. As soon as the vote closes, the result is known uh, and um, I can be on the phone. I could be in a live event or one of my colleagues as well could be in a live event saying, right, this is who won. We can share the, share the screen and show you who won at one minute past seven if the vote closes at seven and that, that can be done. I can't stress enough how important I think randomised candidates is. Um, several projects that we've been supporting have numerous candidates, you know, up to 50 um, choices to make. If they are not randomised, if they're in alphabetical order, you will see the A projects getting voted more than the Z projects. We can see that in the Scottish Parliament on the list system. We know that more people with a, uh, an A surname are in the Parliament than uh, a Z surname in this, on, the, on the list system. This is a known effect at all levels of democracy. Randomising candidates is much, much easier to do on digital than it could ever be on face to face. It's anonymous. People who want to vote for less projects, uh, less popular projects can do so without fear of criticism. I think particularly with your sticky dot exercise, you know, if you want to vote for, you know, a, a project that other you think other people in your community might not like. Um, and, you know, I'm sure we could all think of uh, unpopular projects in certain communities uh, like nimbyism and all that kind of stuff. You can do that without fear of, um, of any retaliation or retribution or that, something like that. If you do it online via anonymous system, because you're just going to do it at home, do it yourself. It's accessible at the convenience of the voter on their own or supported by a group. One criticism that's made of digital processes is particularly people with disabilities, and I absolutely take that. However, my counter to that is if you have someone with a disability who would not be able to complete on their own a paper ballot paper, then you would you would have a support worker with them to help them and support them complete the paper ballot paper. That supporter could have an iPad. It would be the same. So it doesn't it, it doesn't make it accessible. Digital is still not accessible to cer certain groups, but it doesn't make it any less accessible than it would have been with a paper vote. And I think that's an important uh, distinction for me. Two more slides. So what have we learned? Uh, digital offers a, a way to participate on their own terms, in their own time, in their own space, supported by their own workers. This is crucial for young people who maybe are struggling for time, who don't feel comfortable going to the community centre, who don't feel comfortable in large groups of adults and people like that. Um, but there are other people as well as young people for whom anxiety, social anxiety, and I know I love going to my community centre and having a cup of tea and a wee, you know, a biscuit and having a natter or something like that, but not everyone likes that and digital can, can support with that. It's not either or. Digital tools can be used in a face-to-face -face setting. If you go into someone's doorstep, you could have an iPad or a phone, you could help them uh, on the doorstep, but you can't use those face-to-face -face paper boards in an online space. So it, it's not, we're not saying that digital uh, is not about face-to-face. -face. It's just, it could be a supporter of face-to-face. -face. It doesn't just happen. You still need staff, whether they're out there with boots on the ground or out there on Instagram and TikTok telling people to vote. They need to be out there telling people that the vote is taking place or it's coming up and all the rest of it. It doesn't um, it doesn't save money in terms of staff capacity to tell people that a vote is take, taking place. 
and young people expect online as an option and other communities in 2023 it's just it's just the look can i vote on my phone is the question we will get asked uh and they, there's an expe expectation that that will be what's happening the accessibility of information is critical a huge list of projects going to make it really difficult to engage uh keywords and accessible language would be my suggestion uh, and i've said this to some of you before in another group but my uh, we talked earlier about you know community councils having a vote, which is valid. But actually, if you've got you know a hundred projects, each of which has a hundred words, even even a hundred words, which isn't very many, that's a significant amount of reading. And what you might end up with is only people who have the time to read all that data having a vote. In which case, you may as well just ask the community council who are the people who've got the time to read all that information. Okay, so um, maybe shortlisting. Uh, maybe an iterative process where uh, you have smaller groups honing down the number of projects or the number of ideas and being ruthless in that shortlisting to make sure that everyone who is in the pot fits the criteria and you limit the amount of data that someone who's only engaging with the vote has to read. Now, it's really difficult because we don't want to be um, patronising to people who are voting. We want to give them a full choice. But actually, it's no choice. If you've got 100 projects with 1,000 words in each, no one's reading all that information. You know, nobody. Uh, if you've got 100 projects with 100 words each, that's still a lot of reading. 10,000 words is a lot of reading, particularly for someone, who, a young person or someone with a disability. So being clear about the number of projects that are on offer and how you're going to do that, and maybe doing it by constituency or in an iterative way or um theming your pb so that you limit the number of projects in each of the pots and we have a couple of questions if we have got time for that paul or do you want to save them till the end we've got we've got time for questions specifically okay. so there are um uh here's a question are there exceptions in the voting rules for young people who live in more than one place? There, there, there are people. So there are a few people with national incitement cards. Uh, there are issues. If you live um, with two parents, for example, one lives in Edinburgh and one lives in Fife, you will likely have one card, an Edinburgh card, but then you should get to vote in Fife because maybe you get to you go to school in Fife. That's where the temporary number system works. So um, you would just explain that to a youth worker or a teacher and that, that person would give you one of the temporary numbers uh, and enable you to vote. You know, they, they, you know, these are relatively small numbers of young people who live across local authority boundaries, but they are, uh, they're not, you know, they, they are catered for, but the barrier to that is they will need to ask someone to get a temporary number uh, rather than just being able to, to get one. But there's an email system for that. You know, they can, uh, you, you know, we, we basically, we pass the decision about who to get a temporary number to, to the local authority. Uh, so you can make that decision, or the, or the voluntary sector partner, you can make that decision about who, who should vote and who shouldn't. Uh, we'll mark that one as red. Do you find that young people are less likely to participate if there is a requirement to register to avoid duplicate voting? Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, ease of access is uh, an issue. And that comes back to this this trichotomy is it trichotomy of like robust low cost um and high turnout you're going to get you could have a really robust system that was uh um relatively um low cost but it wouldn't be very broad if you want to have a robust system where people are pre-registering with their postcode and you know mother's maiden name all that kind of stuff or or you're checking them against the school role that's going to take time um, and it's going to take energy and it's going to take money actually in that case. So you're, you're or, but if you, and if you don't have that money to spend, you're going to get a low turnout to that. Um, so, uh, much less likely to participate if there's a requirement to register. So that is our unique selling point is the young Scott national entitlement card, which you, you, and you hopefully you've seen by now a year, year and a half later that young people now have access to free bus travel aged uh, under 22. So many, many more young people are carrying their young Scott national entitlement card every day. So are much, much more likely to have that when they are asked to vote by a member of staff or they discover it on Instagram or something like that. Uh, 